Welcome back to another installment of Tarot Card Meanings with Benabel, a video lecture series where we cover the Marseille system of unillustrated pips, the Rider Waite Smith, and the Thoth, compared side by side along with the deck I created, the Spirit Keeper's Tarot, the Full Color Revelation Edition. This lecture will be on the Minor Arcana Nines. You're familiar with the drill by now. Let's review the map of where we've been. You're looking at the Naples arrangement of the Tree of Life most commonly found in Hermetic Kabbalah and Christianized Western occultism. We start with the crown, in tarot, the realm of the aces. This is the numinous void, the first expression of divine will. Think enlightened consciousness. Kokma is the realm of the twos, the primordial Torah the sephira of wisdom, and symbolic of the blueprint for the cosmos. Mbina is understanding. This is the divine womb, the highest sephira along the feminine pillar. Think the primordial quantum foam, space-time before the cosmos is created. We then returned to Chokmah to embody the tarot kings. In the SKT, these are the archangels. Then back to Bina to embody the queens or shields. Below the abyss, through that into Chassad, dwelling of the fours, we cultivate mercy and grace. Chassad is loving kindness or unconditional love. The fives in Givera designate strength. This is law, justice, but also restraint and constraint. This is structure and order created from boundaries. Onward to Tifrith to study the sixes. Tifrith is the duality of love and pain, truth and beauty. This is Bodhisattva consciousness compared to Ketor, the aces, the emanation of enlightened consciousness. Tifrith is associated with the Messiah. Descending below the veil or Pekoreth reside knowledge of the sevens and Netzach. Netzach is victory, triumph, and mastery. These are victories with enduring eternal implications. The lateral path takes us to Hod, the eights, or splendor. This is glory, gratitude, humility, integrity, and elegance. There's a profound paradox here. This is the willingness to be submissive because you've internalized the full strength of your power. Back up to Tifrith to study the knights. In the SKT, these are the shining ones. Emerging from behind the veil of Pekareth to Yesod, dwelling of the nines, is where we are now. Yesod is the foundation, a gestation place of sorts, for bonding, imprinting, and intimacy. Yesod is the sephira of the foundation. Yesod is the source of magic, where magic begins, where one has access to the non-linear continuum of space-time through its association with the sexual life force of creation. The metaphor used for Yesod is that of the phallus, though alternatively it's the channel of the birth canal. But author Mark Horn emphasizes that Yasad is so much more than that. It's the yearning within us, that desire to connect, to bond with others, to be imprinted by others and imprint upon others, that spiritually intimate exchange. Because that bonding is what gives us a sense of safety and security in this world. All upper Sephirotic energies merge here before it continues onto Malkuth. The Golden Dawn astrological correspondence for Yesod is the moon, though Gary M. Jaron, author and scholar in Jewish studies, notes that Yesod corresponds to Venus. Which is it? I don't have the mastery or authority to make that judgment call. You'll recall from our last video lecture that the Tree of Life to the left with the I Ching correspondences is sourced from Crowley's Equinox. Under Crowley's I Ching, Kabbalah, and Tarot correspondences, Yesod, the Nines, is assigned to the trigram water. So all four Nines in the Tarot exemplify water from the Ba Gua. 
I've devised a different system following the elementals, not numerology. So the nine of scepters, wands, is fire. The nine of chalices, cups, is water. The nine of swords is heaven, which can be extrapolated to the metaphor of sky. And the nine of orbs, the suit of pentacles, the earthly realm, corresponds with the trigram earth. Nines in general are about the end result, the culmination of all decisions you've made up to the eights, and now in the nines, it's time to reap what has been sown, for better and for worse. Highlighted on screen are the RWS nines, the version most tarot readers are familiar with. I want to talk about the Marseille or non-narrative pips. Focus on the top left corner eight of wands or eight of scepters. Keep your focus on the eight scepters and the ornamentation with the pair of flowers. For the nines, the flowers transform into a solid scepter at the fulcrum of the eight. Now look over to the right at the nine of cups. Focus your gaze and watch the eight transform into the nine. The transformation of the formation is what will be significant in how you interpret non-narrative pips such as what you'd find in Marseille decks. Focus now on the bottom left corner nine of swords with the curved scimitars. The center flower becomes a sword piercing upward. Now watch the eight of coins in the bottom right transform into the arrangement in the nine of coins. In the Thoth, the color palette transformations are of significance. Also, we look to the keywords, which are really more titles of these spirits animating each card. The Lord of Strength, Lord of Happiness, Lord of Cruelty, and Lord of Gain. We'll also be covering the Revelation edition of the deck I illustrated, the SKT. The nines in tarot show the resulting consequences, the output of the input that came before. There's an intensity here in the energies that's not in the lower numbered pips. On screen, you're looking at the eights, which you studied in our last video. Watch the screen as it transforms into the Nine of Wands, noting what exactly changes. The floral patterns are replaced by that added scepter along the center vertical. The flowers in the eight could represent fruition, blossoming of success, whereas here, this severe rod is about the establishment of order and how discipline yields success. Traditionally, this card indicates the strengthening of or amplifying of success and the rod of discipline, order, and sovereignty gives even more momentum after the Eight of Wands. In fortune telling, this card can predict that a gift will be bestowed upon you. But there's a different interpretation of that center vertical rod. It's disrupting the balance and harmony of the Eight Rods in symmetry. Dr. Yov Bendov says the center rod suggests an oppositional disrupting force that brings delays, even stoppage of work. We might be looking at wasted efforts rather than success, fatigue and struggling with exhaustion rather than order and discipline. How do you reconcile these varied meanings? Hmm. My opinion is you learn by experience. Write down all of these different conflicting meanings into your study journal. Consult it during your beginner level and even intermediate level readings. And eventually you'll live and learn which ones work for you and which ones seem to just be totally wrong. Now let's compare that to the most popular narratively illustrated version of the Nine of Wands from the RWS system. Here, Waite describes the guy as if expecting and waiting for an enemy. This is about establishing a strong defense. And yeah, this is about a gatekeeper with a positive connotation because this gatekeeper is a protector, a formidable one at that. The Nine of Wands is often interpreted as having been injured, but not defeated. In contemporary times, I often read the RWS version of this card as someone building up walls to protect themselves because they've been hurt before. This is not letting love in, that fire-water opposition per elemental dignities. 
Reversed says weight. This card portends obstacles, adversity, calamity. Look at the imagery on that card upside down. It evokes a weak defense, not being able to protect and being vulnerable to injury or attacks. In the Thoth, the Nine of Wands is the Lord of Strength. This is the moon in Sagittarius. You see the glyph for the zodiac sign near the bottom. Notice the arrows and how they're made up of crescent moons. The arrowheads are curved moons rather than sharp offensive points. Crowley notes the weakening of fiery Sagittarian energy here because of the watery moon. There is also an implication to Yasad on the Tree of Life, which corresponds with the moon. This is equilibrium as defined in physics, says Crowley. This is when neither the state of motion nor one's internal energy changes. There is no linear acceleration and no angular acceleration, but it is a precarious balance. Any little interference or flicker and the house of cards could fall. You must constantly change yourself in order to remain stable and secure, in order to maintain your strength and power. Appearing on screen is the Eight of Cups from the Marseille. Now keep your eyes on the screen and watch it transform into the Nine of Cups, which Dr. Yov Bendoff in the open reading assigns the keyword harmony. You're looking at the Convertero, where the plant decorations suggests harmonious group dynamics, interconnection, and different parts of a system working in harmony with one another. Papus and Atea, often seen as the origins and source of where tarot card meanings have evolved from, says this card can portend motherhood. This card is also about triumph and victory as a direct result of team effort of the group working in harmony. Left to right along the bottom, the non-narrative versions of the Nine of Cups are from the Baleen, Boda Tarot, and Atea by way of Huya Orsini. Upright, per Atea's keywords, this card is victory, success, yes, reversed, sincerity, things are as they seem, intentions are earnest. In Pamela Coleman Smith's illustration for the Nine of Cups, we see someone described as being of high social status who is feasting. This card's energy is all about material abundance and forecasts a secure future to come. Eden Gray tells us that the Nine of Cups is the wish card. What the seeker most desires is what shall come to pass. Reversed, this card can suggest hedonism or sensual self-indulgence that is likely to result in self-destruction if you don't change course now. In the pictorial key, Waite acknowledges that the meaning of the Nine of Cups in reverse varies a lot. Everything from truth and loyalty to liberty to mistakes and imperfections. Oh, okay, it means whatever you want it to mean. The Thoth version of this card, the Lord of Happiness, I have to say, is a truly beautiful work of art. I love the color contrast of the pale gold, yellows, and lilacs, and that ombre blue and gray in the background, and the highly reflective surface of the water along the bottom. Crowley describes this as a card of refinement and good fortune. Dreams come true. That's quite an echoing of the sentiment of this being the wish card. When the Nine of Cups shows up with that beneficent Jupiter in Pisces astrological influence, you know that the best possible outcome will be the outcome that manifests. The Eight of Swords shows a blossom imprisoned at the center, confined. Yet there are blossoms free and wandering along the periphery outside the Cage of Swords. This is a mentalist trick. Are you the center blossom or the blossoms outside? Now watch how the blossom becomes a sword piercing out from that cage in the Nine of Swords. This is revenge, enmity, hatred, the active effects of the evil eye. Yet here goes the wide range of card meanings. The Nine of Swords can also indicate a priest, a member of the clergy. The Nine of Swords can also indicate someone growing a conscience and doing the right thing. 
Reversed, Atea says this card means distrust, and the card immediately following the reversed Nine of Swords reveals what it is not to be trusted. But then Dr. Yovendov's keyword for the Nine of Swords is courage. This is winning a battle against all odds. Despite these setbacks or the opposition being stronger than you, you come out the victor as a result of your courage and perseverance. Reversed, though, this card is about reckless sloppiness and, as a result, failure. The illustrated Nine of Swords in the RWS appears rather self-explanatory in meaning. Let's zoom in on some of the symbolism here nonetheless. Seasoned readers like to point at the planetary and zodiac symbols stitched into the bedding and the two jousters carved into the panel of wood. Eden Gray describes this scene as two swordsmen, one fallen at the thrust of the other. Here is someone clearly and visibly still shaken by a past injury or disappointment. The blanket features both zodiac signs and planetary glyphs alternating with red roses. I interpret the red roses here as symbolic of martyrdom, which is a common interpretation in Latinized Christendom. Historically, in North Africa and parts of the Holy Land, the sign of the red rose was a sign of being God's favorite or favor from the gods. Alternating with signs and planets evocative of a birth chart or fate, I read the blanket as a very positive omen in spite of the overarching Nine of Swords energy, which is a reassuring sign that you are protected by your gods. No matter how hard life seems right now, have faith and just know you are divinely guided. The common interpretation for this card shouldn't be too big of a surprise to you. This is about despair, mourning, feeling so haunted by something that has happened to you that you can't sleep well at night, you're losing sleep over it. There's also this sense that you're immobilized by misfortune or disaster, so it echoes a bit of the Eight of Swords, except here maybe it isn't so much circumstances confining you, but your own thoughts and fears, anxieties in your head rather than circumstances in your physical life path. There's also this traditional meaning interpreted out of an Atea tradition, and that's of miscarriage, disappointed in an outcome. This can be a miscarriage of something you had created, or it can be a miscarriage of justice. Reversed, the Atea tradition of interpreting the upside down Nine of Swords is as a warning. Someone from beyond the veil is coming through to warn you, don't trust. And then either the card immediately following the reversed Nine of Swords, you pull or a follow-up clarifier card, but what this next card is will tell you who or what not to trust. This subsequent card reveals the deceiver. If there is no subsequent card in a spread and you want to pull an additional clarifying card, shuffle your deck and focus on the question, what is it I should not trust while anchoring your attention on the visual that is the reversed Nine of Swords? Then pull a card. Eden Gray, however, reads an optimistic note from the reversed Nine of Swords. A reversed Nine of Swords signifies healing, recovery, and a divine omen that if you have faith, your luck will change for the better. How do you reconcile these totally contradictory meanings whenever it happens among established card meanings? <laughs> Darn it if I know. That's something you've got to figure out for yourself. I am just here to report data. The Thoth Nine of Swords is the Lord of Cruelty, where in Crowley's words, the Ruach consumes itself. Ruach is the Hebrew word for spirit or wind, often drawing the equivalence to the Greek word pneuma for breath or spirit that connects the universe to itself, that keeps all of the cosmos together. It's the invisible binding, the threading, perhaps akin to dark matter, the cosmic cement, keeping in check the expansion of the universe. What's intriguing to me is if you take a look at the pattern that the curved swords in the Marseille Nine of Swords form, 
I mean, just the composition of the Marseille card here kind of looks like a diagram of our universe, and the lines almost look like they represent Ruach. And it's okay to tell me if I'm reaching here, but the composition is like a geometric thumbnail of the classic world card, or in the thought, the universe. But here in the Nine of Swords, that ninth sword is puncturing through the perfect arrangement or harmony of the cosmos. So it's a pictorial representation of the Ruach, or Numa, the cosmic connective tissue consuming itself. Finally, if you look closely at the swords here, the blades are disintegrating, almost as if from something acidic, and you see chips all along the blades. If the Ruach is that cosmic space you see in between and around the nine swords, it's eating away at its own creation, those swords. And the swords themselves are made of Ruach, hence dripping the red droplets from their tips. Thus, this depicts the Ruach consuming itself. In terms of what Crowley says the Nine of Swords designates, this is obstruction of justice, whether in the form of intentionally harming another or intentional self-destruction. This resonates with the traditional divinatory meaning of miscarriage, such as a miscarriage of justice. The sword's suit relates to our mental state, so the Nine of Swords also denotes pessimism as the prevailing mental state. It is, quoting from Crowley, the acrimonious taint of analysis. To be acrimonious is to be overly harsh, bitter in nature, sharp, and bitter in the way you are communicating, and just in general a sharp and bitter persona. Analysis is the opposite of synthesis, where synthesis means to combine and harmonize. Synthesis is what happens when the alchemical marriage, the sacred wedding, the process for producing the great work. Analysis, in contrast, is separating, dismantling, and deconstructing. In mundane fortune-telling predictive terms, this might indicate a breakup, a divorce, an uncoupling. The Eight of Coins showed symmetry and balance, suggesting uniformity of routine work resulting in financial success. Hard work pays off. The Nine of Coins is assigned the keyword prudence by Pappus through Ateus card meanings, which was Crowley's assigned keyword for the Eight of Discs, the Lord of Prudence. So there's that discrepancy to contend with. Yov Bendov assigns the keyword motivation to the Nine of Coins. See, if the Eight of Coins was about diligent work toward achievement of your goal with that symmetry of coins, the Nine of Coins with that center coin is about carving a niche for yourself within an existing system. It's being independent, financially independent and self-sustaining because you've created your own fruitful dominion. In sum, this card is about long-term good fortune as a direct result of your own non-conformist or unconventional ideas for success. According to Atea, reversed, the Nine of Coins will pretty much mean the same thing that it means upright. The Nine of Pentacles, illustrated in the RWS, shows a well-dressed woman standing alone in her vineyard. This might be a biblical symbolic reference to the people or the works of a creator, and thus the woman you see portends a great leader. Eden Gray interprets the vineyard as symbolic of plenitude and prosperity. The falcon on her gloved hand symbolized tame, well-controlled thoughts. The classical meaning ascribed to this card is of someone alone, solitary, who appears to have it all materially, but may be lacking that emotional, interpersonal connection that she's craving. The overarching meaning conveyed by this card is that of accomplishment and high achievement. So high above the rest of the people that you feel alone amongst your property acquisitions. Reversed, Eden Gray notes that the ill-dignified Nine of Pentacles can signify a loss of a friendship or the loss of a home or property and possibly from thieves, stolen goods. A reversed Nine of Pentacles can portend financial or legal troubles. 
Atea, by way of Pappus, says the reversed Nine of Pentacles predicts a voided project or serves as a warning to be cautious. The Thoth Nine of Discs is the Lord of Gain. This card, writes Crowley, purrs with satisfaction at having harvested what it sowed. Earlier, when we covered the RWS, I said that the keywords that are most thematic for the Nine of Pentacles are prosperity, plenitude, and accomplishment. And then in the RWS Nine of Pentacles, you can see the implication of loneliness and the consequence of a solitary state when you achieve prosperity and accomplishment. That's echoed here in the key title on the Thoth, the Lord of Gain. The other key passage instructing how we interpret the Lord of Gain is this. This card designates that what transpires, all that happens, everything is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. I know most RWS readers expect to see a lone woman in an estate of plenitude when we're talking about the Nine of Pentacles. No lie, for the longest time ever as a tarot reader, me too. The more I read and reread how Waite described this scene, though, the more I felt like I had to very intentionally transform how the meaning of this card is conveyed, specifically the collective unconscious conceptualizing of accomplishment as towering above the people, symbolized by those grapes in the vineyard, and then, by secondary extension, land or property ownership. Why must we own the land, hold some deed and title over it, have possession to feel secure and abundant? Why the focus on this is all mine, all of it, to express prosperity, plenitude, and success? What about the collective? What about it takes a village, and not just a village, but divine blessings as well? These were the thoughts that formed how I depicted the Nine of Orbs for the SKT revelation. This is a reconstruction of the Inca Empire in where is now modern Peru. There's another little detail in the eminence expressing wealth and abundance that isn't implied in the RWS Nine of Pentacles. The woman in the RWS Nine of Pentacles is in a position of leisure. In the eminence from the SKT, this is a family in possession of wealth and abundance all the same, fully content with the life they've earned for themselves. But look closely, every single one of them is hard at work in some way. Every one of them is actively contributing to the family's wealth and abundance. To achieve this level of prosperity and accomplishment, this eminence, there must first be a humbled sense of spiritual reverence for the divine. That's the Hanampacha, which in Inca cosmology is the higher world in the skies, the starry canopy. This is where gods and ancestors dwell, and pictured here is Shaska associated with Venus, noting that this card is Venus in Virgo, and of the dawn, twilight, fertility, and abundance, among other blessings. Shaska is why flowers and fruits grow aplenty. The Kepacha, the world of human material reality, consists of us, of the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. The Ukupacha is the underworld, where rocks serve as gateway posts into that underworld. The underworld is also where thonic spirits or underworld spirits dwell. This is a realm of the recent dead, the realm of decay. And let's not mince words here. Spirits that can cause some serious trouble in the Kepacha, the human world. When Christian missionaries from Europe first arrived and colonized what is now present-day Peru and Ecuador, Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile, the Inca Empire, they interpreted the spirits of Ucupacha as demons of hell. So there's now that interpretation floating about. Did I just play favorites and spend an inordinate amount of time talking about this particular card? Maybe. None of us are without our biases, I suppose. This card just tugs at my heartstrings. And it was almost personally important to me to transform how the themes of accomplishment and possession of wealth or property is conceptualized. No, we are never alone in our abundance and prosperity. Don't think that way. Plus, 
if you think about it, the mother figure carrying the basket on her shoulders is the equivalent to that lone wealthy woman in the RWS Nine of Pentacles. Oh, and that iconic snail in the bottom left corner of the RWS? Of course, there's an homage to our little snail friend. Before we continue, can we revisit the Thoth Nine of Discs again? Okay, hive mind, someone please help a gal out. I clearly recall hearing about how Lady Frida Harris illustrated portraits of Crowley herself, Israel Rigardi, who was a student of Crowley's, and I cannot for the life of me recall who else was allegedly drawn here. Elvis Levy? Gerald Gardner? Look, I don't even know if this is true or I'm now guilty of perpetuating fake news. I don't know. Do you? No, seriously, if you know anything about this, have heard this before too, any insight at all, please share what you know in the comments. Heck, I even want to know your hypothesis and theories. I'm very curious. There is no way this isn't something. But what is that something? In the Pugilist, this is the Nine of Wands card, the setting is the city of Uruk in ancient Mesopotamia, or more precisely, Sumer. When I say Pugilist, think martial artist. I wanted to depict the ethical or honor codes of warriors. There's a reason I chose to place Hecate, or Hikate, in crone form, front and center, which diverges from the familiar imagery of the RWS, but personifies the imagery in the Marseille. When I superimpose and layer the card images like what you see on screen, it makes a little more sense, right? You see this in the Lady Frida Harris Thoth depiction of the Nine of Wands, too. Previously, we noted that this card can portend a gift being bestowed upon you, and according to weight, signifies a strong defense due to a strong gatekeeper. This is being amplified with divine strength in equilibrium. The inherent trinity you see, formed by Hecate, the pugilist, and the black dog, is the inherent trinity in the nines. The haunt, the Nine of Swords, again features Hecate, now in mother form. This is an intentional magical augmentation from the predecessor Nine of Swords, which does maybe make my Nine of Swords card fluffy. The haunt means all the things that the Nine of Swords has come to mean, except now the final message is this. Do not distress, because divine help will come to you in your darkest hour. Also, again, you'll see a trinity here in the nines formed by the figure in the foreground, the goddess and the demonic shadow. Even the arrangement of swords shows the trinity in the quaternary by showing the binary in the trinity that will equal nine. Plus, I feel like this meaning was covered in the RWS Nine of Swords in that detail on the bedding. There is precedent set and implied for the Nine of Swords that no matter how frightening things are at the moment, divine guidance is coming because you are protected by higher powers. The Nine of Cups, the wish granted, features Tridevi, the Hindu triple goddess or triple form of Shakti that is Lakshmi, Durga, and Sarasvati. The arrangement of the chalices follows the Thoth and represents a magic square. This card brings the blessings of the triple goddess. Earlier when we covered the Nine of Pentacles, I explained why I didn't go with the lone wealthy woman RWS imagery for this card, and meanwhile paid homage to the color schemes and geometric design in the Thoth Nine of Discs. The arrangement of the orbs here is to symbolize different methods of summation to nine, and because here we are now in the earthly plane, we're focusing on the quaternary, the fours that represent materialized solid order. We still have the Maiden Mother and Crone Trinity, now as humans rather than as divinities. Confession. With the SKT revelation, specifically this full color iteration of the deck, I do not read with reversals. But don't let that stop you from doing what you want to do with the cards. Yet, what are my thoughts on reading reversals with the SKT? Okay. First, I would say in the SKT specifically, if a card appears in reverse, the essence of that energy is present but blocked, challenged, neglected, or overlooked, so it's calling to you to rectify it. 
The reversed card is demanding to be upright and dignified in your life, and if dignified will help you solve the problem you're facing. But first, you need to take the action to rectify or to acknowledge this energy's presence. A reversed Nine of Swords, when referring to the past, can mean neglecting trauma, unresolved shadow matters that are causing you anxiety and are the source of your present fears. In a forecasting future possibility position, this is warning of something that could happen but is totally still preventable. A reversed Nine of Chalices in the past can mean life or the situation didn't turn out the way you had hoped for, the way you wanted. Read this reversed card exactly the way you'd read any Nine of Cups card reversed. In the future position, it can mean that what you are contemplating or desiring to self-indulge in does not have the blessings of the goddess. And I cannot stress this point enough. Trust your own intuition and judgment. Trust that the gods and spirits speak to you directly. Leave me and leave my artist intentions out of the equation entirely. Yes, animating the roadmap of Sephiroth on the Tree of Life, we've explored in the paths of light journeyed upon up to this point, because the more you see it and visualize it, the closer you get to understanding Hermetic Kabbala. We've now concluded our exploration of the Tarot Nines in the Sephiroth Yassad, where the vital soul develops, where the astral body is realized. Next on our journey in this video lecture series is Malkuth, where we'll cover the tens, and finally, the pages. I know you put up with the wonky audio quality in this video lecture series, and I thank you for your tolerance. If bad audio quality and monotone voiceover notwithstanding, you still want to see this series completed, then please show your support by liking this video, subscribing, and leave a comment.